You know what time it is. Yo, homie, peep this! Tempo, check it out, you know, he makes it funky, and he's good to go. Oh, dang, catch the moon, New York, L.A., and San Francisco. Tempo, the house tonight, you know he's gonna move your mind. The groove is out of sight. It's funky as you wanna be. Tempo, the house tonight, you know he's gonna move your mind. The groove is out of sight. It's funky as you wanna be. Hang on. Before I get into tempo, I want to talk about Sonic the Hedgehog first. Sonic started as a gameplay idea before a character was designed to embody it. That concept, as developed by Naoto Oshima and Yuji Naka, was speed. Yuji Naka said, I like fast things and I thought that it would be nice to create a game where the more skilled you become, the faster you can complete a stage. With that as the game basis, Hirokazu Yasuhara, the director of the project, knew they'd need a character that could move fast but also ball up to attack enemies. They started with a rabbit and an armadillo but they found that a hedgehog worked best, as its quills and ball form would give the illusion of speed and make it a plausible projectile with which to attack enemies. He was a fighter as well as a speedster. So, when you look at Tempo, what does he convey to you? His eyes and forearms indicate he's an insect. He can probably jump or fly. His headphones indicate he's got that Shibuya cool vibe happening. And his animations indicate he's got rhythm and sweet moves. He's probably a dancer. You'd expect his initial game would be a mascot platformer featuring dancing and a 2D jet set radio vibe. And you wouldn't be half wrong. The details, though, are a bit more complex. See, instead of being a game that defines a character, Tempo is a character who defines his games. Instead of having a game in search of a character for its mechanics, Tempo is a character in search of a game. Tempo featured in three games. First, Tempo for the 32X, developed by Red Entertainment. They had previous experience working on the first Bonk title, so Sega pursued them to make a platformer that would show off the increased color palette and sprite warping capabilities of their new Genesis add-on. Next was Tempo Jr. for the Game Gear, developed by Sims, a different company with extensive experience with Master System and Game Gear. They picked up a lot of Red's lessons from the first game and made a competent handheld experience, featuring most of the same characters from the first game. Finally, though, was the Japan-only Super Tempo for the Sega Saturn, developed by Aspect with some of the staff from Red's development team. This is where Tempo finally found his game. Let's have a look at his journey. Tempo for the 32X was released in 1995, and yes, this is the US cover. Pretty 90s. The first interesting thing about the game is that they included the full 35 second tempo intro theme at some obscenely low bitrate. But even then, it must be taking up a good portion of the ROM. Once we get into the actual game though, it's back to the standard Genesis MIDI with the occasional sample thrown in. And there's a huge amount of references to music in this game. Single floating notes heal you. Giant notes fully heal you. And occasionally you'll find a different kind of note that if you touch it, more notes will spawn, playing a little tune. The latter are only for bonus points, though. I will get to the points problem in a bit. As well, in every stage, there's a little area labeled Dance, where Tempo will do a little dance and summon his friend Katie. She has a couple purposes in each level, in addition to looking very sweet. Aww. When Tempo snaps his fingers, musical notes come out to stun enemies, and she'll fly over and boot them off the screen. Also, there's a spot in every stage where you'll need her to remove a barrier for you to get some optional goodie. It's never mandatory, though. Take too much damage, and she'll fly away. The big problem, though, is that you never directly participate in this dance party. There's no reason to hit any buttons to the beat. Tempo's dancing is automatic when you hit a dance floor. He doesn't even move like he's dancing, like in Michael Jackson's Moonwalker. The developers missed out on a great opportunity to synergize the gameplay with the visuals. 
because as it is, Tempo's controls are decent. Strictly average platformer-wise. His walk feels a bit too slow, but it's because the levels are so packed with enemies and stage hazards. He does have a dash, but he's not invulnerable during it, and it doesn't count as an attack. It's really only useful in areas where you've already cleaned out the enemies. Otherwise, it'll make Tempo run smack dab into one and take damage. He's got the standard mascot platformer Goomba Stomp, and a kick, as well as his snap stun move to handle most enemies. But there are the occasional foes like the electric charges in stage 2 which are immune. Tempo is always in danger, often from the level itself. In Sonic, the player has relative freedom to jump and roll around, and generally enjoy movement until they hit the labyrinth zone. Tempo is the labyrinth zone crushed into a very small space which looked like a cross between a Trapper Keeper and a Newgrounds Flash game. The scenery is always turned up to 11. If you bought a 32X, you got your money's worth here with all the animation. It's just that Tempo is a grasshopper, and it's not particularly fun to jump with him. He does jump fine, and he has a super jump even, but there's nothing close to sublime about it, which is something this game really needs. Each level's art style is amusing on its own, but inconsistent when you compare the levels together. It's never clear where you're supposed to go, and it's made even less clear because the level end isn't always in the lower right-hand side of the screen. But on your first time playing through though, you never know. Sometimes it's on the left under the starting spot, and the level is a big spiral to get there. Tempo is visually and organically disorientating. It has that old gameplay graphics dissonance where it expects you to be all pumped up and psyched to play the level, but you need to play slowly and conservatively to successfully traverse it. There's a few mini-games that you can play with the coins you earn in each level, but they're nothing special. It would have been nice if the mechanics in these mini-games had been in the actual levels, similar to the hacking in Nier Automata. The series does get better though, I promise you. Another very interesting thing about the game is its boss progression. The first three bosses are a boxing glove, a set of headphones, and a tap dancing shoe. Each of them is lovingly rendered in early 90s CGI and stretched and rotated with the power of the 32X. They also stand out from the game's hand-drawn sprites. These bosses would have been fine in a game like Clockwork Knight where all the sprites were rendered, but here it's just discordant. All the subsequent bosses, though, are hand-drawn sprites that fit into the art style. Fine. The clown, the bee triplet, and the big transforming beetle at the end. These hand-drawn bosses also get a little dance when they beat tempo. Here are some. <laughs> The pixel art gave the developers a lot more control over the bosses in their game, and you can feel them trying new things but never mastering any of them as they progress through tempo. They dial back a lot of the level gimmicks like the ceiling dropping down on the first stage, but then they bring in new ones like <sighs> the teleporting point puzzles and the multiple doorway mazes, and there's no way to get through any of these levels aside from brute force repetition. But here's the kicker. Due to a programming bug, you'll probably never get to see the best endings of this game, ever. The number of points you have determines which ending you'll get, but the amount of points you need for the best endings is astronomically higher than you'll even get on an excellent playthrough. You need to intentionally grind score in order to unlock these endings. Now, an earlier build of the game had the enemies getting more points when killed, so the assumption is that the programmers forgot to correct the endpoint requirements as well. Oops. I put a link below to a video that has all the endings if you're curious. Tempo 32X was a good learning experience for the Red Entertainment folks, though. Next, we'll boogie over to Tempo 2 and see what Sims did with it. Tempo Jr. shares the same basic level structure as Tempo 32X. Tempo is participating in a dance-off run by the dapper Major Minor, but unlike on the 32X, Tempo can't do the levels in any order, only through a linear progression. He retains most of his moves, the dash, the stun, 
and the Goomba Stomp. He's still got the kick, only it's contact space now when close to stunned enemies. Also, I love his standing on the edge animation. The most significant change is that each level has a goal now. You're no longer moving from the entry to the exit. Now you have to collect items such as this golden note or pieces of music to progress. If you don't pick them up, the level exit won't spawn when you get to it. As before, the exit spawns were not in one consistent place in the level either, but this was series tradition at this point. Being on the Game Gear, the backgrounds aren't as busy, and the enemies are a lot simpler, which overall improves the tempo experience. Unfortunately, Katie only appears during the scripted dance after each boss fight. The bosses themselves include the final three bosses in Tempo 32X. The Clown, the Bee, and the Transforming Beetle. As well as two new bosses, the Frog and the Penguin. I prefer the latter two, actually, because of the predictability of their mechanics. They sit on one side of the screen and throw projectiles at you. The Frog even throws their head, which is the only way to damage it and you can totally cheese it by standing on the left side of the screen and spamming attacks to beat it. The Penguin boss has a good pattern as well, switching between throwing snowballs horizontally at you, and then changing them up by dropping them vertically on you, keeping you moving about. You'll get to fight every boss twice, because there's a boss rush at the end. And the Transforming Beetle is annoying as ever. This is me jumping on its head without doing any damage. The frames of animation during which they can be hit are pretty sparse, and they can't be stunned with the snap notes, but they do go down. One place where the game does make concessions to its musical roots, though, are its two minigames, one of which is basically Simon Says, and the other of which is a timing-based strongman smash the bell game. You spend the coins you collect in every level to play these games to increase your score, which thankfully doesn't affect which ending you get this time. It's a nice gesture, as I said before. I want to commend Tempo Jr. for adding checkpoints to every level. It's much less frustrating than it was in Tempo 32X to lose all your level progress when dying and being expected to wade through all those enemies, mazes, and death traps again. Kudos! Finally, I wonder why there's only one B-Girl in the B-Boss battle, instead of the three that it was in the Tempo 32X. I know it's probably due to system limitations, but the sprites for all three B-Girls are shown dancing in the end credits. Overall, Tempo Jr. was a solid game. Not especially unique or memorable, but it wouldn't have been a bad Christmas gift for some American or European kid. Fun fact, this is the only Tempo game to have been released in Europe. After Tempo had gone back to his mascot platformer roots, it feels as if there was some dissatisfaction within the members of Red Entertainment who had migrated over to Aspect. It's like they'd had enough of pussyfooting around the traditional concepts of platforming, and wanted to make a game that threw out this whole adherence to platforming tradition. Yes! They went balls out weird with the gameplay and goals in the Japan-only title Super Tempo. And at last, Tempo and Katie found their game. The first thing you notice, aside from the fact you need to understand Japanese to follow the story, is that Tempo's core moveset has been stripped down. He loses his Goomba Stomp and Wall Jump and a lot of other moves. His run has been turned into an inching mechanic that is only good for picking up power-ups that run away from you. He only has his snap notes to bubble enemies and then kick them which reduces a lot of his options when traversing levels. It's also a real pain when fighting bosses. But there are improvements. His walking speed feels more natural in these large levels. You can increase his health bar with those pickups that run away from you if you don't shimmy towards them. When you die, you literally shed your previous body and restart on the exact point where you died. You can even do that in the middle of boss battles. And Katie is now playable. You can switch between them on some levels. Instead of shooting bubbles, she has a flamethrower. And instead of floating downwards like Tempo, she can float upwards with her flames. And hang on, I know that those of you who have played this game are saying, what about the power-ups? We're getting there. First, I need to talk about the experience of playing this game. In the first level, you have to swim in a milky white pond being filled by a waterfall. And when you get up to the top and you see where the water is coming from, yeah? This game is lovingly irreverent and just embraces that. Look at the first boss. It's a plump robot frog thing, and you can't seem to hurt it with your bubbles. It spits out polywogs at you, and the only thing that you seem to be able to do is bubble those frogs like Steven Universe and pop them for notes. 
until one of those popped pogs gives you a black and white key. And then... Yeah, it gets better. Next is a spooky haunted stage with zombies and mummies that introduces you to several new mechanics, including the windmill. The new enemies take a lot more notes to bubble. I think a few too many? Anyhow, while wandering around, you'll encounter a ghost donkey, which follows you throughout the level. When you reach the end, the door is closed, but the Bremen sign has four animals on it, one of which you have. It's the goal-based stages from Tempo Jr. returning to the game, and it's actually teaching you the goal in a way I wouldn't have expected Tempo 32X to do. And in case you didn't get the message the first time, the animals are plastered in the wall in another part of the level. Soon you'll find the chicken, but the remaining ghost animals will be too high up for Tempo to reach himself, until you switch to Katie. So she picks up the cat from a Shinto shrine in the sky house. And as for the dog, she does a little puzzle from which you can select any animal you want. She picks the right one, go her, gets the dog, and then takes all four of them to the Bremen door. This is what I'm talking about when it comes to minigame game integration. Also, the animations are great in this. Here's a little concert that the animals play for Katie when she leaves the level. You'll have also noticed that notes don't heal you. Cookies do. Notes give yen now, and your total is listed in the bottom right-hand corner of the screen. At the end of every round, your total yen is counted and it allows you to pick one of the three classes of prize to put in your home. There's books, fish, transformers, and all kinds of other things that you can use to decorate your home. You can also pick up home decorations in the levels themselves, like a mermaid at the beginning of the game. These decorations determine your ending. Yeah, yeah, the point system for getting endings is back, but they fixed it this time. I got one of the best. See? Here it is. Satisfied? Okay. Anyway, house decoration is fun and gives you an incentive to collect notes that Tempo 32X never did. Just to shake things up, in the next level, Tempo is turned into a metal monster and Katie has to rescue him. The trio of bee singers are back, and this time, it's a shooter. And because the designers know that you're as big of a game geek as they are, the game plays Missile Command and a bunch of other early 80s games at you while displaying a lot of the backgrounds from Tempo 32X. Next, you'll face a robot pelican who does the same gimmick as the frog boss, pelting you with things you need to shoot to spawn the power-up for the next phase of the fight. And this power-up is, oh my god, this is freaking awesome! So Super Katie knocks more objects back at the boss while the boss is in the whirlwind phase. and just straight up punches the boss in the final phase until it explodes. Katie has one more shooting level, burning through ice columns to get to Tempo's evil form, and then, aw, how sweet. Tempo returns to normal, and you take control of him again. The next level is fairly standard platforming for Tempo, that is, until you take to the skies and turn to Katie again. And then you find out that you can get the cool power-up glove anywhere. It doesn't last long. But it's pretty cool. 
The next boss is a robot crab that you need to hit with bubbles in order to fight. Nothing special. For the next level though, I hope you have your recording software ready. Or your VCR if you're back in the 90s. First you have to climb to the top of this evil space platform by riding the rocks that fall down it. And the rocks falling are randomized, so there's no guarantee you'll have another rock to grab on while you go up. More often than not, you'll fall, as you can see in my footage here. Now, as you go up, you'll pass by these giant gears which turn colors when you touch them. You'd think they were checkpoints, but no. When you reach the top, after popping another pelican, you come to a room in which you have to put in a four-character password with four available characters, a clef and three notes. And when you get them wrong, you have to do the level over again. It turns out, each of those gears you pass displays one digit of the passcode in order, and the passcode is randomly generated every time. So I hope you are paying attention. It's a cute idea, but it's frustrated a lot of players with this game. So then your house is attached to an alicorn and you fly off because super tempo. And then it's another auto scroller with a twist. You're given a question in Japanese and you have to fly in the path of the correct answer. Fortunately, if you hang on the right side of the stage, you can usually see the cheerleader that indicates the correct answer or the black hole that indicates you have the wrong answer. After passing five questions, you fly through a maze and ultimately come to the evil planet that's been causing all the ruckus. And inside you find... Oh, you have to be kidding me. It's another set of maze rooms just like in the previous two Tempo games. I guess it's a series staple. But finally, Tempo reaches the top of the mecha planet. And strange things happen. There's a boss rush and an annoying return of the windmills where you need to use them to throw yourself around the room. You next need to fight through a wave of clones of Tempo, Katie, Super Katie, and Super Tempo. And once that's over, after everything that you've struggled with, well, <laughs> check it out yourself. turns into a giant mecha dragon and has a shootout with the evil planet, Gyrus style. Fortunately, it's not a hard fight. When the planet is destroyed, all becomes well. The kidnap girl cashes in all your household items for score. And then, well, here's that ending again, you perverts. Super Tempo is the culmination of the series' ambitions, and it's good that they got there, even if it took them three tries. Tempo seems more comfortable in the batshit Dada space with every idea under the sun being thrown at him than as a stately mascot platformer. It's a shame, though, that as a character, he and Katie don't feel like comfortable residents of this wacky space. Aside from their power-ups, they feel a little too well-groomed for the space they inhabit. But Tempo... Tempo's alright. He's as funky as you want to be, and for him, that's probably good enough. No matter what game he's in. I also want, actually want to give kind of a weird shout out here, but it's to uh, a person named Alicia Gormanson, which uh, she's the only person I've ever seen that's actually documented every ending in this game. And I actually learned that yesterday. Uh, it's kind of impressive. It's, it really helps me understand this game a lot better. 